Welcome back um, to the trading room. My name's Ed Ponzi. I'll be your host here for, uh, let's say, 60 of the next 90 minutes. How's that? Once one way to put it. Um, this is your room. Feel free uh, to take advantage of that. Um, the way it works here, we do live interactive analysis of the markets, both technical, fundamental, uh, anything at all, anything under the sun. And feel free, if you have questions, to go ahead and ask. Uh, I, I welcome your questions. I'm here to help you. Just uh, press enter. Uh, well, type in your question and press enter, and we will. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer it for you. Um, came up with a few new things I wanted to show you, too, first of all. Um, I know that a lot of you folks have questions about uh, the yield curve. There's a lot of talk about the yield curve right now. And the yield curve right now is steepening. And somebody wanted to know, well, what's the simplest way to tell if the yield curve is steepening? And I thought about it. And I said, well, actually, you could pull up this ETF, which is STPP. Right? That's uh, the uh, Treasury steepener. This goes up when the yield curve is steepening. And you can see that the yield curve is, is clearly steepening just by looking at this chart. Okay, in fact, you have uh, the 50-day moving average in blue is about to cross the 200-day moving average. And you can see there's a very steady steepening of the yield curve since May. Why does that matter? Well, um, if you think about it, uh, the way banks make money, you know, they, uh, they borrow at the short end of the yield curve and they... Uh, and they lend at the long end of the yield curve. So they borrow money short term, and they lend it to you for a 30-year mortgage, and they make the difference in interest rates. The steeper the yield curve is, the better opportunity the banks have to make money on things like home loans, etc. And so when I see this, the yield curve steepening, I start looking at bank charts right, for my stock trading, uh, for myself and for my clients. right, And... Um, but anyway, I thought that was something cool to share with you. And by the way, if the yield curve is flattening, there's an ETF for that too. It's FLAT. And if you look at that, the yield curve is falling here. Because why? Because the yield curve is not flattening. The yield curve is steepening. I thought that was some fun, some fun stuff for you to start the day with. All right. Let's take a look at the dollar index and see what's been cooking overnight. We do a lot of technical analysis here, but we also do a tremendous amount of fundamental analysis. We try to meld them um, into something that makes sense. And um, right here today, here we see um, the U.S. dollar index. That's been a pretty wild uh, ride up until now, as you can see. What happened um, this year, the dollar was in rally mode for most of the year. We pulled back sharply beginning in late May when Ben Bernanke started talking about tapering. The dollar fell hard, fell very hard when it broke the trend line right here. Right, very sharp drop. Fell right to support at 80.50. Why is that support? If you go back, you can see that this area was resistance early this year, late last year. And if you go back a little further, Right, this area was resistance back in early 2012, and since Bernanke, um, you know, caused this uh, to fall, it hit support, and now with Bernanke's latest speech, it started to pop up again. So it's funny how this dollar is basically a puppet, uh, and Bernanke is pulling the strings uh, on this. But I'm beginning to believe that this could turn around. You can see how we bump up into that trend line and pulled back two, two sessions ago. We're up against it again today. Um, and there's a lot of resistance up ahead up here. See this red line? There's a lot of resistance back here, the red line being the top of the left shoulder. This was basically forming a head and shoulders. I see a left shoulder. I see a head. It never formed the right shoulder, at least not yet. Okay, so I do think this dollar move could run a little bit further, but it's starting to get into an area where it's going to have trouble. It's going to have trouble again with this trend line, but that trend line is rising, so the dollar can continue to rise without violating it. But 
both the trend line and the price are going to come into contact with that red line pretty soon. And that means to me the dollar is probably going to, going to reverse. Now, dollar strength has caused the euro to push down pretty hard. Again, since really this is all since, since Bernanke's latest speech was on uh, Wednesday of last week, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six days ago, right? Um, and you can see it's been nothing but downhill ever since. Um, this is maybe the coolest chart, because I'm going to show you something that I find pretty interesting as, as somebody who, who gets into charts a little bit. I can see this head and shoulders right here that formed in January and February, right? Left, head, right. But I see that also as the head, right, in here in blue, of another head and shoulders, right? Left, head, and right. So that's a head and shoulders here within another head and shoulders here. And this entire pattern is within another head and shoulders. This is the head here. Okay. You can see the left shoulder. You can see the head. And it was trying to form a right shoulder. But the right shoulder, I guess you could say, before it could be completed, we shot higher. And now we have another one forming. Right? It never completed the right shoulder. But now we have this, which looks like it could be forming a second right shoulder. That's not unprecedented. We've seen that from time to time uh, on patterns that formed a second right shoulder before they broke down. They usually don't. They usually do not break above this uh, the, the shoulder line. They usually do not break above the high of the shoulder. Um, so this is kind of an unusual one, but it's still potentially a head and shoulders within a head and shoulders within a head and shoulders, which is something that most people probably haven't haven't noticed. Uh, about it, and that and that could take us down. First of all, that could take us down well below 130. I mean, we're we're back at 130 again already. We're we're back at 130 again already. This could take us at least down to the neckline, which is about 127.50. Yeah, there's a little bit of support here. Call this the area of around 128, maybe a little bit above 128. There's a little bit of support, but the big support. For euro right now is 127.50, and that's a long way off. It's still almost 300 pips away, so there could be a big move in the euro uh, before before that's tested. One of the things that um, we spoke about on here, and I've spoke about a great deal lately, is you know that when they're coming down fast and hard, and the candles are big and red, you probably don't want to go against that, and especially. Uh, once it gets under 132, right, then this uptrend, this little uptrend is over. Once you can see, I could see it pulling back to 132 and maybe getting a bounce there, but once it broke 132, there's no reason we should be trying to buy this. In fact, um, most likely, um, you know, maybe the, the best move is to, is to sell rallies right now on Euro. Uh, of course, euro is not the weakest thing out there. If the dollar is getting strong, right? If the dollar is getting strong, well, no. If you're if you're selling um, if you're selling euro, you're going long the dollar. Okay. If you're selling euro, you're going long the dollar. I do think there's a little bit of upside left for the dollar index, and I think there's a little bit of downside left for this. Okay. But good, good question, Pan on Fire. Uh, Jeffrey says, Ed, just one question. We saw the Australian government so unstable again today. Previous uh, PM Gillard was ousted by Rudd. The elections are only 100 days away. Actually, it, okay, this is a very interesting point because a lot, of, um, a lot of what goes on in the currency market is political. 
but you're not seeing the Australian dollar get get hit here, right? You're not seeing the Australian dollar get hit. And let me explain first of all. No matter who the next prime minister is for Australia, whether it's Rudd, who's from Gillard's party, or the opponent, um, opposition party, please throw the name out there, it escapes me right now. Whoever is the next PM of, of Australia is probably going to be more business friendly than Gillard. Um, Abbott, right, Tony Abbott. Now, if, if, now, I don't know anything about politics in Australia, and I'm not trying to present myself as any type of expert on Australian politics. You know, I'm not from Australia or anything like that. But my understanding is that business was very unhappy with Gillard. And Abbott potentially could be much better for business. Not, I don't know anything about whether he would be a better leader. I don't know if he would be better for the Australian people. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is uh, he would be better for business. And what's better for business is probably better for the currency. And um, he would conduct austerity. Okay, but okay, you got to understand something, too. Like, austerity is for people who, like, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot in Europe. Europe's in, in this deep debt. Australia, not so much, okay? I mean, Europe is really in a, has a lot of debt problems. The U.S. has big debt problems. Australia doesn't. All right? And so it depends what you mean, might mean when you say uh, conduct austerity. That's a word that gets thrown around a lot, that gets abused a lot these days. And some people are trying to turn that into a dirty word. But the truth is, you know, countries who do conduct austerity don't end up getting bailed out. You know, Germany, why is Germany not need a bailout? But Greece does, right? Well, you know, so, you know, it's not as if austerity is a bad thing in and of itself. It's, it's a bad way to get out of um, debt because you need to um, stimulate the economy uh, to get out of debt. But um, I don't think, um, like, for example, to me, taxes are austerity, right? So Gillard went and put a very large tax on the miners a few years back, if I remember correctly. Well, to me, that's austerity. Okay. And if you ask the mining companies, they'll tell you that that's austerity. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Gotcha, right? Kevin Rudd wanted a larger mining tax, and that's why he was ousted and replaced by Gillard. I'm aware of that. That was a few years back. But what I'm saying is Abbott, I imagine, would probably be campaigning uh, against that. Okay? And uh, that sort of thing is very bad for business. And I'll never forget, when Rudd was still in charge, uh, I actually followed Gillard onto uh, CNBC one night. Gillard was on right ahead of me, okay? And Gillard said something that, as a trader, I found appalling. She said that the mining boom, ha I'm trying to remember the exact words she said. I'm going to have to paraphrase. But we were talking about the Australian budget. And she said the mining boom has continued and will continue. And therefore, they were going to spend more money because she assumes, or her party assumes, that the mining boom will continue. Don't you feel that that's a dangerous assumption? I mean, I do. I would never assume that the mining boom would continue. That's nuts, okay? And for her to say that tells me that she doesn't know what she's talking about. Now, she might just be speaking the party line, but you, you don't go on and say the mining boom will continue. All right? Because, why? Because you could tax it out of existence. And the mining boom ended. Thank you very much. And I followed her on TV that night, and I said, I can't believe what I just heard. 
you know, because um, this was back when they had Squawk Australia, remember that? And uh, Mandy Drury was the host. I followed her. I was in, in the booth in New York, and I said, I can't believe what I just heard. That, that's, that sounds to me like somebody who's not in touch. You know, I mean, you know, um, how about if I told you, you know what, I'm going to take out a big loan and buy a, a, a vacation house because the stock market is going up and it will continue to go up, and therefore I will be wealthier, so I'm going to spend the money now. You'd think I was an idiot if I said something like that. Okay? <laughs> All right. So I thought she was crazy to say it. Uh, is TradeStation a good tool? Yeah, I think TradeStation is really good. Um, it's a great way to explain stuff to folks. For example, you know, I'm just looking at this right now uh, at, at Aussie. Aussie's very oversold, of course. It's in a downtrend. It could rally here. You know, it looks to me like the 20-day moving average is probably going to act as some kind of resistance. Uh, definitely, pref I prefer TradeStation for sure. Um, the thing about MT4, well, the thing is, is too, I trade stocks and forex. So, um, if if um, if I'm trading MT4 for forex, then I need two separate platforms. I can do everything on one platform with this, and um, so so that's that's one of the reasons why. Okay, um, okay. So anyway, so let's not get into an argument over Australian politics. I can't even believe I'm I'm having this discussion. I just I was standing in Times Square in the, the NASDAQ uh, building studying this piece of paper. I guess my eyes were burning a hole through it because I was trying to understand what was going on in Australia. And um, the the cast from Fast Money walked by, Guy Adami, and they, they had just finished their show. And Guy says to me, do it from the heart, man. Do it from the heart. I'm, I said, what are you talking about? This is the Australian budget. How do I do that from the heart? I'd like to see you do that from the heart. So anyway, uh, but I do love I do love it, um, you know. But Australia, right, probably can rally a little bit here. Aussie can probably rally a little bit uh, up to around this twenty day moving average, and then it's going to hit a brick wall. So, um, and I have no idea how that election is going to impact everything. But I will tell you this, you know, the the Aussie's a little bit stronger today. Euro Aussie has been one of the trades that we've been talking about for a long time because I'm I'm, a, I'm very big into trends. And we're getting a, a, a major pullback today. So whatever is happening in Australia, the Australian dollar seems to like it. Because Aussie is stronger than the euro. Aussie is stronger than the British pound today. It's stronger than the U.S. dollar. So whatever happened, you know, out there, Australian dollar liked it. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Probably the next most interesting one that we'll be speaking about is the dollar yen uh, currency pair. This chart looks an awful lot like the uh, like the U.S. dollar uh, index. And when the dollar index, well, I think when the dollar turns around, this might be the best. This might be a good one to get short, but we'll see what happens when it gets there. If the dollar index turns around, um, you've got a, a big trend here. You've got a left shoulder ahead. That red line is basically the neckline. And we break through the trend line. Then we bounce up, bounce back into the trend line, acts as resistance. And then shoots down to 94. And if you look at that, I mean, that that's a pretty violent move from 103 to 94. Now, what's happened since then? This move, we, we've had, a, I would call it maybe a little bit of a relief rally up to 98 or so. But look what's happening to the candles now. The candles are getting smaller. In other words, you can see the bodies of the candles are green. It's fairly big. It's a little smaller. It's a little smaller. It's a spinning top. And, right, and then it's, you know, small-bodied candles generally mean that, um, generally mean that the move is losing steam. So I'm starting to think that this move could be losing some steam here. Uh, a lot of it has to do with stocks in the stock market, of course. And, um, you know, um, it's funny how last year, um, last year is very different from this year. This year, the stock market rallied, and this dollar-yen rallies with it just straight up uh, in a straight line. Um, 
we break that support line heavily right around the same time that the dollar index breaks that support line. And um, we finally find some support, but this move looks like it's running out of gas. Just like I said, the, the dollar index move might be running out of gas. This one really looks like it's running out of gas. And um, so I'm considering getting short here. One way to get short would be to, like if we had a close under that red line, that might be one way to do it. Um, but it's interesting how much this parallels the U.S. stock market. If you look at this chart and you look at this chart, they kind of fall apart at the same time. And um, they're not, uh, obviously they're not a 100% uh, correlation, but it's fairly strong correlation there between stocks and the dollar yen. Uh, I do think that there was a big change with dollar yen. Um, that's going to really affect uh, Japan going forward was loss of support of the IMF. Um, when the International Monetary Fund pulled their support away from Japan and said the yen weakness had gone far enough, that was kind of a killer uh, for for this for this chart. That that really put an end to it. So yen weakness unlikely to continue without international support. Uh, at least not at the pace that we saw earlier. So um, I'm still pretty bearish here. Uh, to me, this looks like you know we still this looks like it's going to end up being a lower high, and we're going to stay underneath that trend line at least for now. So um, that's um, you know that's another one that that's to take a look at. Now, usually what we try to do is match the strong up against the weak, and uh, Right now, you know, the dollar has been fairly strong. The, the yen has been hanging in there against it, right? And the Nikkei had a big role to play in there, too. See, this is another reason why I like trade station. I jump back and forth between stocks. There's your Nikkei, and your Nikkei is going to correspond a great deal to that yen chart as well. And, um, you know, the Nikkei looks like it's found some support. A lot of people are now starting to go in and say, well, this is beginning to look better. But... Um, I, again, it's it's hard for me to see how Japan's going to keep the ball rolling. It's very important to Japan to have support of the IMF and to have support um, of the other countries from the G7, the G20, and that support has finally begun to crack. And to me, that's that's when it all changed. You know, a few weeks ago, the IMF said, you know, this yen weakness has gone far enough, and right then is where everything changed. Because I don't know, um, I guess, I assume that Japan believes they can't go it alone, that they need support from the international community. And the international community has provided support before, too. You remember this, right? The huge rally off the uh, tsunami bottom here, right? That was an intervention by the G7, right? The U.S. was in here buying, um, the U.K., even uh, Korea was, South Korea was in here buying, right? Everybody was in here buying to try to help out Japan. So, in a way, I guess they feel indebted to the international community, and I don't think they're going don't, to, I don't think they can, they even believe that they can do this without support. What happens if they lose support? Well, you know, when this yen is getting weaker, other countries feel that they're taking bread out of their mouths, right? Like, you know, countries that compete with Japan, like China, uh, South Korea, uh, other uh, smaller Asian countries who compete with Japan to export stuff to the U.S. and, and the Europe. And you're going to lose support among those countries. And, that, and then what happens when you lose support? Well, when um, Japan and China got into a dispute last year, what did China do? They stopped importing stuff from Japan. I mean, it really, there was a huge drop-off of imports from Japan in China when that dispute occurred. So, you know, keep in mind, like, these things do matter, and when you see that support beginning to crack, then you know that that yen weakness trade is, is in a, a great deal of difficulty. All right, I see questions coming in, but, um, you know, I'm not going to turn this into a trade station class. Like, I, I really like using it because we can, um, um, you know, and, and uh, 
you know, my company, edponzi.com, does a lot of work with TradeStation, but it's a great teaching tool. You know, I can show you correlations uh, on here. There's a lot of cool things that we can do. Um, but I'm not going to, but, but please, let's talk about the markets, right? I don't want to, because if, if we turn it into a TradeStation class, we bore everyone else. I don't want to do that, right? Try to keep it fast moving here. Is gold turning? I'll tell you what, man. People who've been betting on that have just been burned over and over again. And this is GLD, by the way. It's not gold per se. This is what we call paper gold in the U.S. Um, and it, it, it's down again overnight, if you can believe it. Um, GLD, the bid is 119. The offer is 119.50, which means it's if it's if it, if it's turning, it's 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 not turning higher. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's actually going to fall off the bottom of the chart uh, at the open, uh, and it's going to, you know, create a new candle. It's going to be, it's going to gap lower on this chart, considerably lower. And this happened during the Asian session last night. All the metals are in big trouble, but the one thing that really I'm thinking about hardcore because it is China. Because when I when I think of China, I think of copper. I look look at this chart, okay. This is a, this goes back to 2009, right? This is copper. It's JJC. It's, it's, an, it's an ETF. I don't trade futures. What I do is I trade individual stocks. I trade futures via ETFs. So I, I can trade copper. I can trade gold. And I trade currency. So I can cover the whole gamut through TradeStation. That's one of the cool things I like about this. Uh, Pierre says dollar going strong. Gold will gold go down? I don't know if gold and the dollar are really have a relationship at this point, but I'm concerned about this because China consumes 40 percent of the world's copper, and it looks to me like today could be the day, right, that this sucker breaks down. JJC is bid. Well, it's a lot less liquid, but it's bid 36, which is right here. But let's say that 36 is right there. So as copper is going to gap down too, and it's going to gap down to a four-year low at the open. Okay, and um, that four-year low, right? Yeah, that four-year low. Is, what's that telling you about China? If China consumes forty percent of the world's copper, okay, maybe there's something really wrong. And um, I'll show you something else, right? We've been talking a lot about Shibor lately in the room here, because think about it, right? The, the the bank rate, the rate at which banks are lending money to each other in China, has been going wild, and um, at one point the overnight rate got up to thirteen percent overnight. Now. China has, uh, the, the People's Bank of China has a perfectly good explanation for this. And you can see that the rate shoots up above 13%. ON is overnight, right? It goes above 13%. Now it's come all the way back down. China injected some liquidity. China is saying, People's Bank of China is saying that this is, this is due to the end of the half year, the end of the quarter, that Banks are required to keep more money on hand at the end of the quarter. Okay, that's all well and good, but if that's true, then why uh, did this pop? Does it happen every six months? No. <laughs> okay, it didn't happen six months ago. I mean, we had the end of the half six months ago. We had the end of the year six months ago. Where's the big spike? Okay, so... There might be more to meet more than meets the eye going on in China right now. Okay, all right. Let's go one more here. We got GDP coming out in one minute. We're gonna we're gonna pull up uh, the FX Street calendar. Guest seventy two fifty eight says GDP is coming. And let's take a look. You sure about that? (laughs) 
Okay. Um, today is Wednesday. So what, what do we have? GDP? There we go. 1.8. Oh, that's terrible. And uh, that's annualized, of course, for Q1. Wow. Well, that's going to put an end to, to some tapering talk, don't you think? Um, let's take a look and see if there's any reaction going on here. We'll go to the one minute. I think you got to believe that that's going to be the end of all the tapering talk. Uh, there you see a little 20, 20 pip spike on Euro USD. So that's actually dollar weakness. Um, wow. That's a big miss. Okay. Um, you don't normally see them miss by six tenths on expectations. Okay. Um, wowzers. It's all I can say, man. That's a bad number. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no polite way to spin that. Let's take a look at the S and P's. Yeah, yeah, no reaction on S&Ps. I guess the S&P is saying, look, this means we're going to get more candy. Right? And there's a yeah, dollar yen coming down fast. Little 25 pip move in one minute. Yeah, but I, I'm not seeing much on the S&P. could be that the S&P is... Um, Maybe it's just not reflected yet, or perhaps there's something funny going on there. But, man, that's a brutal miss, folks. That is just an incredible miss. Okay. Uh, all right, gang. The way we, we operated here, we run two 30-minute segments. Uh, I'm scheduled to start again at 9 o'clock. I'll try to I'll jump in a little bit early, so stick around. Um, I'm going to grab a cup of coffee and... Make sure my positions are all where I want them to be <laughs> based on this number. I'll be back in just a little bit for the second session. I've really enjoyed having you on here. Let's meet back up here again in less than a half hour. Until then, my name is Ed Ponzi, your FX educator here on behalf of FX Street. I'll see you back here in less than 30 minutes. Everybody take care.